by 2030. From Italy. From Denmark. United Kingdom. From Melbourne in Australia. France. From Taipei. Switzerland. De Bogota, Colombia. From Ghent. Belgium. From Mexico City. From Western Canada. USA. De Buenos Aires, Argentina. Chile. Colombia. Y Brasil. Melbourne, LA and London. Across our entire global business. For the future of our home planet. This summit is bringing together leaders from around the world, a community of people committed to using the enormous power of business as a force for good. We're here to connect, to channel our collective courage, and to catalyze fierce determination to move faster, both individually and collectively, to stabilize our climate. Friends, let's be clear, this is an emergency. These are dangerous times. The scientific community is of one mind in warning us that we must cut global greenhouse emissions by 50% by 2030, meaning over the next nine years. In the words of Extinction Rebellion co-founder, Gail Bradbrook, this is not a time for talk. This is a time to act and to act now. In this spirit, our community's work to address climate emergency is oriented around three bold ambitions. Ambition number one is to redefine what it means to lead in such times. Ambition number two is to drive climate action centered in climate justice. And bold ambition number three is to change the rules of the game. Now, one example of how we're redefining leadership and setting the pace on the race to zero as a community is the 533 brave B Corps who committed to net zero by 2030 at UN's COP25 in 2019 for scopes one and two and most relevant scope three emissions. It was the largest and most aggressive climate commitment to date by a group of businesses and 20 years ahead of the Paris Agreement 2050 targets. As part of that push to set the pace, there are now over 1300 businesses, both B Corps and other businesses that are committed to net zero emissions by 2030. What we ask is for all of you to engage in this summit and this work with fierce determination to act, putting people and justice at the center of your work and looking for ways that you can work collectively to aim higher, dig deeper, and move faster towards a just zero carbon future. We want you to act in a way that shows that you are moved by what is needed rather than limited by what feels possible. So to all of you today, be courageous, be radical, be fiercely determined, and be the change. Climate change disproportionately and negatively impacts people who are least responsible for creating it especially Black, Indigenous, and people of color, communities that are impoverished and groups who are minoritized worldwide in far-reaching ways. Instead of embracing these truths, we often focus our climate conversations on decarbonization and net zero, and there actually isn't enough carbon credits to buy to even get to net zero for everybody who's committed, rather than fully integrating the lived experience of those on the front lines of this emergency. We have less than 10 years to have global emissions, this decade is pivotal to our very survival as a species and our work to get there must place people and justice at the center of our work and our focus on people. Businesses must do their part to fix our climate, but we will not be able to achieve a zero carbon future without fundamental reforms to our economic system. For the past 50 years, the doctrine of shareholder primacy has led to business becoming the primary driver of environmental and social degradation and driven society and our biosphere to the brink of collapse. And for the past 15 years, Bill and Sistema B have been working in markets all over the world to change public policies that govern our economy and the purpose of business. We now have voluntary stakeholder-based corporate governance reforms in over 50 different jurisdictions and over 10,000 businesses that have adopted this corporate form in a global community of over 4,000 certified big corporations that are living examples of walking the talk on stakeholder governance. Bill Labs global policy strategy is now going beyond voluntary benefit corporate adoption to drive system level policy change 
to enable a full shift to stakeholder capital so that all businesses and fiduciaries are accountable to maximizing benefits to all of their stakeholders, including the environment. We also need to work together with collective voice to pass meaningful climate policy, such a transition to 100% clean, renewable energy, and a price on carbon, so that zero carbon future is even possible. The climate emergency demands radical collaboration and knowledge sharing, the likes of which we have not yet achieved. And as Charmian was reflecting on, what does this type of collaboration need to be rooted in for it to be radical? No different to the core of this work, our collaborations also need to be rooted around people. I think this is at the heart of the B Corp Climate Collective, a global and local network of climate leaders with over 2,000 active volunteers from around the world. This is a community of trust that is actively sharing and pooling knowledge to help equip B Corps and all businesses for climate action, justice and advocacy, and to accelerate the private sector's work to address the climate emergency. Moreover, we're also honored to be working next to partners like the UNFCCC, including the Marrakesh Partnership and the Race to Zero teams, TEDx Countdown, Oxford University and the Skoll Center for Social Entrepreneurship, CERES, the Climate Collaborative and many, many more friends and fellows uh, and fellow travelers. And yet we need to continue growing and fostering this coalition for it to lead the way in our broader climate mobilization of the global vehicle community and beyond. In early 2021, we worked closely with the Oxford Net Zero team to create the B Climate Tools Base. This is an open source global library of tools to help businesses take action um, on climate, including achieving net zero and centering climate justice. It's all totally free and downloadable and includes toolkits, guides, case studies, webinars, and reports. And they're all smartly curated to make them easy to find. Partner with others. Climate action is not about competition, but radical collaboration. We must share the knowledge and resources we have to get to a zero carbon future. One great place to start is to get active in the B Corp Climate Collective in your region. And if one doesn't exist, start one. Then do the work. This cannot and must not be about commitments alone. This is the time to act and to act now. We at the B Corp community consider ourselves as purpose-driven business people. Well, climate action is no longer a purpose. It's a condition. It's a moral duty and should be part of all of our metrics of success from now on. The climate crisis is here. We're already going through hell and things will only get exponentially worse as business as usual practices continue and key players keep spewing out empty rhetoric and false promises. I have run out of words. I don't know how to stress enough that what we are doing now, especially the private sector and world leaders, is nowhere near enough. So I'll let the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Scientists remind you. Just last week in the 23rd, some UN draft reports were leaked. What did it say? Species extinction, more widespread disease, unlivable heat, ecosystem collapse, Cities menaced by rising seas, these and other devastating climate impacts are accelerating and bound to become painfully obvious before a child born today turns 30. That means less than 30 years from now. I'll let that sink in. Has it sunk in yet? Has it sunk in that major cities across the world will sink? That people will drown in floods even more than they already have today. On one side of the planet, you have people drowning from floods. On the other side of the planet, you have people dying of thirst. We need you to prioritize the people and the planet over profit. And I know some of you say you already do, but we need more. And we need you to help pressure the other private sectors, especially the biggest polluters, to do the same. When I say we, I don't just mean people from the Philippines or the global south, not just our generation of youth, but humanity, which you are part of. The richest elite have a debt to pay for the climate crisis that is happening to us. And when we are talking about climate action and justice, it means recognizing that countries and people least responsible for the crisis are the ones most impacted. 
So check your supply and distribution chains. Beyond sustainability, look at the rights of your workers and your partner's workers. Look at the brutality of how the materials are being extracted from our lands here in the Global South for the profit of the Global North. I know it's difficult, but I did say that the system was built to be unjust. And one of the things that's been most exciting is being Southern Gen, it's not just supporting um, achievement of carbon targets, but, but it's actually focusing on how we partner uh, with folks and how we help them in their sustainability journey. Because uh, we believe that our consumers would expect our manufacturers to be as serious about the environment and equity and people as we are. Um, so while it may not show up on some of the um, kind of high level carbon targets, it's highly important that we maintain um, a connection with our manufacturing partners and suppliers so that we can leverage um, our kind of collective power to change the things that need to happen further into the supply chain. Um, so aside from you know, supporting that, the decarbonization work has been super important. Um, we talk a lot about the impacts of climate change, um, the disproportionate impact on BIPOC populations um, and the extractive economies that, that come from being tied to these systems. And uh, so for us, it's, it's important to make sure that we're setting aggressive goals and then doing everything we can to get as close to those goals. And we tend to use an aspirational lens um, when we set those goals, because we know it drives us a little bit further um, than we would if we just selected something that felt achievable or, or real. Um, so for me, it's been that, that tie between empowering our suppliers and our supply chain, and then also working, working on kind of the core fundamentals of what it means to be a, a sustainable manufacturer um, and uh, in helping us achieve uh, the goals that we've set. We tried to utilize our power uh, and our voice to ensure that um, we're raising the voices of folks whose voices aren't traditionally raised and that we're shifting systems. So we have a, a very strong activism and advocacy program, which aims to extend green power um, and renewable energy um, across as many markets as we can. So we'll, we'll work towards legislation um, on green power and energy. And we also don't just pay attention to the, the carbon, we pay attention to toxics um, because we know that many of the manufacturing facilities that make toxics are, are part of the climate uh, justice gap that, that we have in the inequity. Um, so we'll also work on, on toxics and, and trying to help the world move towards a more sustainable form of chemistry. Um, so we have our advocacy, activism and advocacy program. Um, we also have a foundation um, and we direct half of our philanthropy um, to Native American and indigenous people um, focused on frontline uh, solutions to, to uh, climate change. Um, we uh, look at it as we design our products. We understand that we need to find a way to um, use less uh, and make more. And that's a real challenge for a growing business. Um, so I think product design remains kind of the most critical area um, that, that we have to hit. It's the, it's the leading edge and everything else is reactive for us and, and costly and expensive and time consuming. Mm -hmm. um, and for us, it's also having built in accountability. So uh, we have a social mission board that, that guides our work. Um, that is comprised of everyone from Mindy Luber at Ceres to the, the head of global home care for Unilever and our former co-founders. Um, so a, a number of ways in which we're trying to raise the expectation and just say, this has to be in everything that we do. It's a filter we push through. Um, and supply chain is, is obviously um, a really active area with, with a lot of uh, need, um, given the, the kind of extractive systems that we're tied to. Um, one of our, our largest commitments uh, has been to science-based targets. And, and so we set science-based targets uh, a number of years ago and doing so said that we would reduce our overall, um, overall emissions 90% against a 2012 base year. Um, and within our upstream, uh, it's an 80% reduction um, against that 2012 base year. And for anybody who's in growth mode, you know that uh, those targets can quickly get further and further away. Um, and I think uh, by setting them and knowing they were aggressive and, and in many ways, our theory was if the whole industry needs to shift by 30%, do we really think that the whole industry, industry is gonna shift by 30%? And the answer is no. So we're over indexing and we're accepting that responsibility and, and taking on that task. Um, so that goal has uh, not just affected our upstream but it's consumer use. It's when you 
wash your clothes or, or dry your clothes and uh, what you're tied to for an energy grid, um, whether you use hot water, um, all these things come into play and, and the science-based targets have been a, a nice way for us to bucket our impact and then begin to carve out interventions against each of those areas in a way that feels tangible um, and still stretches. Um, we had two of our uh, manufacturing partners and, and suppliers who have become uh, certified with their own science-based targets. And both of those conversations actually started with 7Gen. Um, you know, they were just asks. Um, and I think that's what we're realizing too is asking and engaging with them and then helping remove barriers is a really effective way to create change in those networks. So what does uh, a science-based target look like in terms of a company? So we have two perfect examples here um, that will give us a nice kind of side-by-side -side comparison of what, what it can look like. So with Intrepid Travel, um, they have committed to reducing their absolute scope one and two greenhouse gas emissions 71% by 2035 from a 2018 base year, as well as reducing their scope three emissions from its offices by 34%. Um, and then from its trips by 56% per passenger um, day over the same period. On the other hand, with Legacy Vacation Resorts, we have established and committed to reducing our scope one and two emissions by 50% by 2030 from a 2018 base year and to measure and reduce our scope three. Um, so I think both of these kind of serve as a really good example because both of us have set our targets and had them approved by the SPTI. However, they do look somewhat different. Um, with LVR, we went through the streamlined small and medium enterprise target validation route. And then looking at Intrepid, they've even gone a step further and set those scope three emission reduction targets. Um, so it's really it just demonstrates the ability um, for you to customize your targets based on um, their, your company makeup, where you are in your journey and, and everything like that. Um, so looking at both of our targets, um, we are still both consistent with reductions to keep warming to 1.5, but it's really kind of up to you. And like I said, where you are in your journey and kind of how your company is um, established. We also used last year really to kind of look at way how we can rebuild better following the pandemic and also kind of really sharing our tools and insights that we have built over the years to encourage others in the travel industry to emerge from the crisis more responsible. So one aspect of that advocacy project was that I authored a 10-step guide, how to decarbonize your travel business, which is a kind of um, a free download that people can access from our website. But the focus is really around kind of sharing our learning best practices and helping other companies to take their first step on their climate journey. The big challenge is our supply chain, which is also about the scope three, um, um, which we touched on already when um, they described the science-based target, because we actually, yeah, we already had measured um, most of our scope three, which will include indirect emission, includes your business travel from your operation, but in our case also of, with all of us, the transport within our itineraries, for example. But for our offices, it's also the commuting, which we had never assessed prior to setting a science-based target. So that's maybe also one point that I want to highlight that through science-based target, you actually dive deeper into your data because we measured before already. So we had done already a lot, but by setting the science-based target, you get pushed to do more. And especially in our case, it's because our indirect emissions in our supply chain are more than 40% of our combined one and two. So that's also why we set also science-based target on scope three. But that's also our challenge because the supply chain of travel industry is complex. Some things are in our control and we can measure like the commuting. Um, we did a commuting survey with all our staff um, in 2019 to understand how people travel to the office. So the mean of transport, but also the distance, because then you can start looking at, can I change the location of the office closer to a transport hub? once a lease, for example, comes up again for renewal or change. But then there's also things like travel, business travel. Business travel we can reduce. We've definitely seen this in the last 18 months and not all will stay, but I think there's also learning in there. But the transport within our trips. So we normally or um, from the start of the company have used a lot of local transport, but in some cases there are internal flights 
And that's mainly around sometimes because of the distance, but maybe also for safety reasons, et cetera. But that doesn't stop us. So what we know as part of science-based target are doing, we're starting to review our top 50 trips. That's a first start in a row of actions that we will do. But by reviewing our top 50 trips for transport, we are basically want to remove and replace the internal flights where possible and where it saves the safety of our customers is first. And examples where we have done it already is um, our trips in China where high-speed trains are available. So that's really, I think, a no-brainer where high-speed trains are available, switch them um, over, like switch the flights over to trains. But then you're looking at Australia where it's a much bigger, a big country, but unfortunately not such a good um, high-speed network. And that's, of course, then a whole other challenge. But that just gives you a taste of, what we can do in operation, which is a bit more in our control, even around the indirect emissions, but the trips, that's where the 15 years will really help us because we need also to operate in a net zero economy. So we are doing our part, working with companies like Legacy Resort Vacation. That's what we need, accommodations that are doing the same, which help us indirectly too. Um, so during 2020, especially when we had very low occupancy or some of our resorts were closed, we really ramped up our guest education campaigns through in-room videos, on-property signage, and social media. Um, we definitely don't want to seem pushy or like we're telling our guests that uh, they need to do something or act in a certain way. But we thought if we, if our guests understood our goals and our mission as a business, um, then they maybe they would be more likely to help us um, reach our goals through simple actions on their end, whether that be turning off the lights and TV when you leave the room or turning off the faucets when you're brushing your teeth, recycling, using the reusable water we give them. Um, so, and then hopefully they will take these habits home with them, which is the ultimate goal. So every guest who comes through our doors returns home with a new insight that they can bring to their own personal lives outside of vacation and hopefully inspire others to plan trips and be more, be more responsible when going on vacations uh, for the planet and the people. The climate change is not going away. Um, it's actually showing us, the pandemic is showing us, um, yeah, when something like this stops the industry, what it means for our travel sector. But climate change has ravaged, even though we had the pandemic, um, we have seen a lot of extreme weather event last year and right now, again, with the heat waves that the most part of North America is going through at the moment and there's no vaccine for climate change. So yes, if you haven't declared, don't feel it's daunting. You, an important part is you are part of a network of a collective. The first step today you already took to listen to us and to Jeremy, most of all, to hear more about tourism declares. Um, it's a first step to really recognize that climate change is much worse than COVID for our industry. And um, we need to work together. And that's really where Tourism Declares comes. Um, you're part of a network. You're no longer working alone, which is similar to the B Tourism Network. It can be very overwhelming and also seem like a daunting task to tackle the climate emergency. And individuals may feel like they have very little control or ability to make change. I know I've personally felt like that. Um, and it really just going right off of Suzanne's um, thought on a green team. I think something that we've done really well this past year in Legacy is getting our employees more involved on the individual le level. Um, we've created a social purpose champions team where one to two individuals from every resort and corporate department are represented on a team focused on making a positive change in our company. So I lead the team in monthly meetings where we discuss upcoming sustainability projects, community outreach, and ideas that they have on what they want to see done differently at Legacy. Um, so creating a, a green task force made up of employees from different levels of the company is definitely a great way to get started, to bounce ideas off each other and just to learn from one another. Obviously, no one knows everything. And mm -hmm. I think it's a great way just to kind of connect with other members of your company and, and really get started. But if creating a corporate team uh, is kind of too big of a leap right now, I think employees just educating themselves is, is a great first step. A small action employees can take is is to understand their own footprint, learning more about how much water and energy they use compared to the average household or understanding their commute better, how they travel and where they can reduce uh, their impacts on a daily basis is something I think anyone can take advantage of. 
better than before with inclusion and equity and shared prosperity, then I think we do have a very uncertain future. Um, I hope other businesses in the industry will look to see how, how B Corps handle their COVID response um, as not only an example of how to bounce back from the pandemic, but bounce forward. So in terms of their approach to environmental and social justice cause um, and really taking decisions with all stakeholders in mind. I know at the end of 2019, Legacy was just celebrating and becoming a certified B Corp. And we were super excited to use the credibility from our certification to grow the sustainable travel industry. Of course, we did not foresee the next year that would bring travel to a halt. Um, and of course, many companies did not survive the year and, and some only did after abandoning their values and their commitments to employees and the community and the environment. Um, I know we were also very concerned that we would need to resort to cost cutting measures um, that could delay some of our commitments to declaring a climate emergency and becoming carbon neutral or ending our self-imposed living wage. But I think unlike traditional travel companies, um, we are one of the almost 4,000 B Corps um, and we obligated ourselves to consider all of our stakeholders when making decisions. So um, just again, I, I think echoing Suzanne, like this is definitely more important now than ever and everyone should, you've taken the first step just being on this call. So um, yeah, just continue on that path. To really think about what does regeneration actually means and um, me as a uh, permaculturist and um, I'm also an Ayurvedic health advisor and a yoga teacher, I work with the concept of regeneration for quite some time in different areas um, and not only in the agricultural area and I've really find it amazing um, in how many areas you can actually apply the regenerate regeneration as a concept and um, for me what is regeneration and and I think that the time of sustainability is over um, that was the buzzword in the last century um, what does sustainability actually mean sustainability we want to sustain what is there and unfortunately most of the environment is already degraded trees and 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 lush diversity we can sustain but in agriculture most of the time we have quite degraded environment and we first need to improve and rebuild and that's i think where the term regeneration came from um and i mean we we always see it when we drive around um depending on where we are in the world but um the soil is degraded, there's hardly any soil life due to pesticide use, um, the soil structure is bare through to um, tillage and compaction, um, there's hardly any organic matter, et cetera, et cetera. So there is, there's so many ways of rebuilding soil. And this can also go hand in hand with combating climate change, because if we make sure that we cover the soil all the time with mulching and cover crops, and we actually making sure that we uh, take the nutrients and the carbon back to the soil, which we actually extracted beforehand. At the moment, we're just extracting everything. We take the plants out, the crops out, and we, we reintroducing uh, artificial fertilizers and not natural products. But if we actually learn to give back to nature, then um, this can actually combat the carbon dioxide uh, emissions as well. And not only a farm on a big land, also, you know, I'm, I'm very much into urban regenerative agriculture, even like someone who is just doing some farming on the window bench or on a balcony. If you do this uh, in a regenerative way, then you can also um, do something for that. And that's what I like. Um, I used to teach kids at school about the ecological footprint. I don't know how many of you are aware of this concept, um, which is basically, we all believe that we have a negative footprint on earth, just by being on the earth and our lifestyle. And after a while, I, don't, I didn't really like this concept anymore, because this is quite a negative imprint you give to kids, you actually have a negative impact because you're there. And um, regeneration actually gives you a positive impact. You can actually increase your positive impact on the healing of the earth through regeneration. That uh, we humans have a negative footprint on earth, 
we, with our uh, creativity, we created waste because in nature there is no waste, right? And regeneration is to work on a positive impact and also a way of integrating our livelihoods with the life in the planet, all living systems. So I'm a biologist and I see the world in a systemic way. I, I, I see the world in fluxes and in, uh, and in networks. And what we are trying to do is to restart and, and to find a way of human beings to be and reclaim again their ecological role within our planet. And the, we do that by restarting again the natural um, processes of life to allow life to do what life do best, that is produce more life, that is produce more diversity, produce richness for everyone. The world and the, the, and the producers that this is the, it's not only the only the best way, but it's getting to be the only way to, to keep living in this, in this planet. I feel like one of the things, one of the premises of this entire summit is that this is a sort of climate emergency and that we can't keep doing what we've been doing, um, that it just won't, that conventional approaches won't work much longer. You know, in fact, they don't really work right now. So if that's the case, then perhaps... We just need, I don't know, to find ways to be louder. Human beings have appeared in the last 40,000 years. The earth has 4 billion. And there's a lot of species that are a lot more intelligent than us. We have to admit that. And, and I think that the key is to, to live the question, to, to really ask questions and, and, and allow that to be our compass to, to, for the next generations is, Make good questions because they will take you to answers that will then take you to better questions. Yes. And I think the key is there because otherwise today's solutions are tomorrow's problems. If we stick to that solution. Right. So the, the key is just like nature. Nature works in this dynamic succession. I hear most of you talking about systemic and dynamic successions that we see in our crops in our farms so the more we imitate our behaviors you know as part of right of nature i think we will start to tap into this intelligence that will guide us through different questions that we might have and take us into different answers of course our context is changing fast right climate change has always happened but today because of us, it's happening at a very rapid rate. So, you know, that's the challenge that I see that we have, but we still, we can still make the decision of, of, of making these turns and, um, and, and taking us towards, you know, life, right? And, and, and what is life? Well, everyone in, in Africa or in, in South America or in North America, or, well togetherness right and whatever you do in africa it's going to have an effect in south america it's going to have an effect in north america whatever you consume you know in a developed country you can start from a very local level and you will have a regional and global impact what do you have in your refrigerator i mean many times myself i go into my refrigerator and i go like a ton of packaging even though it's regenerative organic products Right. But, I, I, you know, it's just like a ton of plastic. And I go like, oh, my God, you know, it's like, you know or, or bringing stable income streams. And all of a sudden, you know, well, what does that do? You know, we, we have we accumulate, we accumulate money and we can buy more stuff and we can do more things. And, you know, instead of distributing, you know, that that wealth. Right, like nature does. But each and every one of us, whether it's individual, businesses, investors, politicians. I've always sort of imagined businesses that start talking about these net zero commitments and sustainability before action. For me, it kind of reminds me of a drunk person standing on a bar and telling everyone that they're going to go sober. 
you know, everyone's just like, you're still drunk on fossil fuels. You've got no chance of going sober. There's no authenticity there. So I do think it needs to start with that action before you can kind of authentically start communicating with your customers. Mm -hmm. We start communicating to customers and encouraging them to change. We sometimes rely on altruism too much. We, we rely on take action because it's the right thing to do. I, I think where communications is going now is actually tapping into the deeper kind of like drivers of communication change, be it a sense of kind of be betterment of your life, a sense of justice or fairness, tapping into those deeper drivers of behavior change with your climate change communications, I think for me makes it that much more compelling. I think businesses should use their marketing budget as a force for good as well. You know, try not to sell your product, but sell inspiration, sell awareness around climate change. Uh, you know, so I, I truly hope that that at some point we'll stop promoting products, but we'll we'll, we'll start you know really creating awareness. Uh, you know, start fundraisers as a company for the planet. Uh, you can do you can do so many things that are also good for your brand, and that are not necessarily focused on on, on selling more products as well. Right. So we need new narratives, and I think that we live in a capitalist system, so it's really difficult to talk about degrowth. Um, even though some brands are starting to do it, which is really incredible. So I would argue that our role is to really, like it's so important right now um, to give a vision of hope, especially for young people. So if we can paint an alternative vision of the future, I think that that's one of the most powerful things that we can do is actually point to a direction. Because climate change is for a lot of people still a very abstract and distant problem. And I think, I think, uh, that is one of the major issues that we have right now because we know the issue of climate change and we also know the solutions. The only problem is how to get people moving. And I think uh, part of the issue is that we, that we communicate it in, a, in, in the wrong way, in a way that it's, that it's either too hopeless. You know, if you hear like trillions, tons of ice melting, it kind of feels like, ah, okay, okay, get away, you know. Uh, and on the other hand, terms like net zero, CO2, methane, uh, decarbonization are also really hard to understand. So, and of course, I, 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 I totally agree that we should also talk about product ut utilities, but I think the bigger question is how can we communicate climate change in a way that people actually feel it? And businesses consciously thinking, having that on the boardroom agenda, having that front of mind, making choices, around that balance between balance, people, profit, and planet. If, if you're doing that every day and that's the discussion and that's the nature of the discussion around your board table, you, you're going to be moving in the right direction. And then this is a this is all about pace. So there, there are sort of easy wins, like we've all got, like, you know, actually, whilst the factory is a massive investment, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, a sort of 250 million euro plant we're building there. It, it's kind of an obvious one. <laughs> Uh, when you get into sea transport and how you change the energy uses there or how you get back further into the agricultural supply chains, the, the, the solutions are not yet clear. But what you have to do is keep testing, opening doors, investing a little bit to understand whether that's a route that you can explore. So, so as much as it's about being curious and prepared to put little bits of money in various places to see what's working, and then once you've got clarity, doubling down on those investments to, to, to then really make progress.